Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Ten years ago, Jennifer Owens and her family hosted some refugees from Nepal for Thanksgiving dinner. Her church had made the connection, seeking American families willing to connect with newcomers for the holiday. That dinner would change Owen's life and many other lives. Inspired by her conversation at dinner, she ended up starting an effort that would eventually become a nonprofit organization. She named it Foray. That's an acronym for Friends of Refugees and Immigrants. It seeks to teach newcomers to the U.S. the skills they need to start businesses and make connections. And it's now celebrating its 10th anniversary. Here to discuss Foray's remarkable work is founder Jennifer Owens. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having us, Sarah. We're also joined by Luz Mila Buchler. She's an immigrant from Colombia and a volunteer with the jewelry team at Foray. Luz Mila, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And we're joined by Ning Lun. She's a refugee from Burma and Foray's assistant sewing coordinator. Lun, welcome to the show. Thank you. So Jennifer, this all came out of dinner. What about that first conversation struck you so deeply? I think the thing that I couldn't get over was meeting um, one of the families that we hosted was headed by a single mom, and she had two school-aged children, and she had been in the U.S. for about two weeks, had lived in a refugee camp for 17 years, didn't speak a word of English, and probably had the equivalent of a second-grade education. And I just could not quit thinking about her and wondering what would I do if I were in that situation. And I had my husband and I had lived overseas for five years. And so I had some, I could imagine being in a different country trying to support my children and wondering what would I do. And so I just couldn't quit thinking about her and spent a lot of time praying and thinking, is there anything that I could? do that would help her make her way here. Now, I feel like a lot of us might have that moment of empathy, but from there, maybe we'd start a GoFundMe or we'd donate some used clothes. How did you get from that thought to actually starting an organization? You know, I really feel like it was just a seed that God put in my mind. I have always enjoyed sewing and handcrafts and when I thought about trying to bridge a language barrier and use... um, maybe skills that I already had or experience that I already had. Working with our hands is what came to my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I just went to other people who had experience in the refugee community or had experience in business and began to kind of throw that idea out. And we came up with what what we came up with. And so this single mother that you met from Nepal, was she one of your original people that you worked with or did it end up going in a different direction with other refugees? Yeah, so she actually never got involved with us. By the time we launched our first meeting, she was already employed somewhere else. But some of her family members who arrived after her were some of the first women to be involved with us. Okay, so you were able to meet lots of other people who mm-hmm. were interested in the, in this group. Oh, yes. Uh, Luz Mila, tell us about you. How did you end up getting involved with Foray? Uh, I was at the church, and one of the women uh, was part of Foray. She was uh, the jewelry coordinator, and she asked me, Hey, Luz Mila, I heard you are going to jewelry classes. I just had it started. So... We had this organization called Fore, and she told me, you know, they will give you, they will teach you a project, Mm -hmm. they will give you the supplies, they will sell the jewelry, and then they will pay you. I said, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I never had heard about something like that. They they are going to do all those things for me. Say, yes, would you like to be part of Fore? Yes, why not? So... My husband had just recently uh, been laid off, mm-hmm. and I was looking for something extra. I already I had a job, but I was looking for something extra money, you know, to make. So I saw this opportunity, and she told me, and you can be not just an artisan, but also a volunteer because you are taking jewelry, 
uh, jewelry classes. So, so you already had a certain level a of skill. A little bit, yes. yes. So what was it like um, when you first started? It must have been just a little um, hard. Women from all over the world speaking different languages, all coming together. Was it hard to even find your place initially? I, I don't think that much because it was a small group. And some of them I already knew from church, mm -hmm. at least the volunteers. So it gave me the opportunity to meet people that probably in other circumstances I never had, you know, met. Mm -hmm. Or I am an, an introverted person, so it gave me the opportunity to, to open up to more people. Mm -hmm. Ning Lun, what about you? When I went to um, New City Church, and then I think maybe Jen <laughs> announcement for A, and then I'm interested to start. So yeah. you didn't know how to sew before you began no. with this project. <laughs> and so you've been involved now for nine years. Yeah, nine years. What kind of difference has it made in your life? I feel so happy <laughs> 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 because um, I don't know how to sew before mm -hmm. I involved for A, so mm -hmm. I'm happy. To and now you know how to sew. Yeah. That's amazing. That. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, how many women or how many people have you worked with um, since your founding 10 years ago? Gosh, I think that we've probably worked with maybe 60 different women have come through the program. We, we've now, we've our model has kind of solidified a little bit more over the years, so we focus on a smaller number of women so we can go deeper with them, but probably 60 women have been part of Foray in different ways over the years. And so you have 11, I, I believe, currently. Mm -hmm. We do. And so how does that model work? Tell us a little bit about how you have sort of organized this. Um, well, we've, we've, because our focus is really on women who need home-based employment, we keep the numbers small because um, we're, we're seeking to give them more work before we expand. Sometimes it's it's very tempting to look for bigger numbers. It sounds better on paper for writing grants, but we have really tried hard to maintain our focus being artisan-centered. So we focus on 11 or 12 women, and about half of them are part of our jewelry team. About half of them are part of the sewing team, although we have a couple of women who are part of both teams. And we made that decision because already being in relationship with them when they had greater financial needs. We wanted to offer them first an opportunity to expand what they were able to generate at home versus expanding the numbers on paper for ourselves. Um, so we, we um, mostly through word of mouth from our artisans, find new artisans to be involved. We, we do partner with other organizations and get referrals from them, but it's mostly through word of mouth from the within their own communities that we find new women. And do the women get a chance to get together, or are they? I know, as you said, you're looking for work that they can do in their homes. Some of them have young children. Where does the the social aspect end up coming in? Yeah, great question. We so we have a workshop about two years ago. We were able to begin leasing space um, down near Bevo Mill, and so we offer classes now in our workshop twice a month for each for the sewing team, twice a month for the jewelry team. So so that, pro that provides kind of the bulk of the community aspect. And so everyone comes together for those classes. But then we send them home with supplies, and, they're, and each woman is paired with a volunteer mentor who will visit her once a month in her home. So then they get some one-on-one -on -one with someone. Um, it might be help in a craft. It might be help with English practice or just things that arise that they need help with. Liz Miller was telling me today on the way here about helping one of our artisans who the bill collector was calling over and over again, and it was a problem with a hospital bill, and it was just too difficult for her to navigate on her own. And so Luce Mila has stepped in and made many phone calls over and over again to kind of navigate that situation. Wow, that's a great service. I mm -hmm. feel like so many of us have trouble dealing with that kind of issue. And when English is your second language, it must be just almost impossible. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Luz Mila, so you get to know these women. You're a, one of the volunteer coordinators. Um, so you're not just getting to know them um, in these larger groups. You're also dealing with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, what kind of role do you find yourself playing in their life? A, a mentor, helping them uh, with uh, techniques mm -hmm. to make the jewelry, to, you know, checking the quality, but also as a friend, someone who comes and 
sometimes uh, I think I'm coming to work in the jewelry. When I come, I find, no, can you make this phone call for me? Can you call the doctor? Um, I need a doctor's appointment, and I don't know how to make it. How I need to call. I, I don't understand. So can you read this letter? I don't understand what they are saying here. And they, okay, so things like that. Mm -hmm. So it had given me an opportunity to go beyond what I thought it was going to be when I started. It has been really, really nice. Yeah. When you first started, you thought maybe you'd just be teaching them how to make these, these crafts. Yeah. yeah, and not really teaching, just helping, because mm -hmm. we have a leader who teaches, but uh, helping them with uh, developing more techniques. So, but then this became uh, bigger, and I'm really thankful for Fore because at least in my case, had given me that opportunity to have this one-on-one -on -one um, meetings with them he had kind of expanded my view and thank you Jennifer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really I feel the same way it's our being in relationship with with someone changes your perspective and you may have one perspective but then when you are in relationship with them you understand that it's different than you thought and, yeah. and better now tell us how does the economics of this work are these crafts then things that you're selling in stores or you're selling online yes uh, we are so our model is based on, on the, the majority of our um, budget comes from selling the crafts, and the women are paid um, a fair wage based on um, each piece that they produce. We sell online. We sell at local festivals. We do probably 30-plus festivals a year. Um, wow. Do the women go to those as well, or is that more um, other yeah, Those people? are usually staffed by um, volunteers and our staff. Um, and then we also have about 16 wholesale partners, both locally, nationally, and we even have one in Canada. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. and when you say wholesale partners, are these shops that one shops, would go to? Shops, yes. Anywhere locally mm -hmm. where, um, you know, a store that our listeners might be able to go to. Yeah, so ZB Market. Oh, yes, um, on South Grand. On South Grand and in Maplewood has um, some of our jewelry, some of our baby things, and then also the Novel Neighbor, the Nook. Um, gosh, I mean, I had made a list. So I wouldn't forget <laughs> Wildflowers, Max Local Buys, St. Louis Style House, The Bridge, Seda, um, and then also Mercy Conference and Retreat Center and Made for Freedom and Root also buy from us. So you're in a number of stores. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to get those stores to sign on for, you know, this sort of untested nonprofit when you started? Uh, you know, I, not really. The people Either people get our message or they don't get it. And so if they get it, then they love what we're doing. They either love things that are locally produced. They love the idea of some way to, I mean, people are, if they're dialed into the refugee crisis, they want to know what can I do and feel like there's nothing they can do. So being able to buy something that actually directly supports someone in their own community means a lot. Now, Loon, I understand you have four children. Yes. And when you were um, when you first got involved with this, all your children were still at home. Um, yes, some are was born somehow, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have four at the time. Yeah. <laughs> was this some these crafts things that you could work on then while they were right there without having to get a babysitter? Um, yeah, um, I watch the baby and then one day sleep or like sometime my husband's before he goes to work and then he watch and then I'm sobbing. Yeah. How important is that, that these are things that women can do in their own home? We think it's really important. I, we feel like this is one of the most um, vulnerable populations, women who really can't, usually because of childcare, but also because of health or age, are just mm -hmm. simply not able to work full time outside of their homes, and yet they real their families really need the income. Mm -hmm. Luz Mila, there's so much diversity in this group. Do you find that the women automatically have a bond of, hey, we're all here in St. Louis and we're not from here? Or does it take a little longer to sort of get to know each other? I think it takes a little bit longer, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think sort of helps people find that common bond? In this case, uh, we have a, a common denominator, let's see, that is jewelry. You're in business together. <laughs> yes, yeah. So at least in, in the meeting, we are sitting like in, in a, at a table where they have to talk, you know, uh, one to each other. Uh, so I think one 
helping each other there, the same artisan, because sometimes one see that the other is doing something that she knows how to do it, and the other one is struggling, so they just start talking. Mm -hmm. Even though one speaks Nepali, the other speaks uh, Burmese, but they have English, you know, they, mm -hmm. they help each other. Mm -hmm. Do you see the women's English getting better as they continue to work together? Yes, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and during the, when I visit them, I am always say, okay, what's the name of this tool? This is a, a plier. This is this. You I see Loon laughing. I think she's had this conversation <laughs> with you. <laughs> but yeah, so little by little, uh, uh, I, I try. My English is not perfect either. I'm learning. But uh, I try things that I see maybe that I can help mm -hmm. in English. Uh, I try. Mm -hmm. yeah. Loon, do you find that you have a favorite craft to make? Yes. Um, baby products. <laughs> baby products? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of baby products are, are available? Yeah, so we make hand-stitched hand um, baby onesies. Oh. Those are really fun. And uh, and then bibs that match that are machine-stitched. They have a, an applique of like a fox face or an elephant or a llama. And I should have to brag on Loon a little bit because as she has come into this position as the assistant sewing coordinator, she's um, also learning to do some of the design work. Mm. So llamas are really popular. So this year I was like, hey, let's look at some llama pictures. And so she ended up drawing the design for the llamas. And and I believe you did the elephant the elephants you redid too. We changed our elephant design. That's great. Yeah. So that's been fun. And we and then we um, added with the llamas like a little a tooth fairy pillow mm -hmm. that's that's a, a larger size of the applique yeah. so that's fun great. things like that it sounds like you guys have, have learned some amazing skills that's <laughs> awesome and Jennifer you mentioned earlier the refugee crisis and mm -hmm. this is something that with our current president he has said he does not want any more refugees in this country he has sort of implied that immigrants don't want to work that we should be testing them to you know for welfare benefits and kicking people out things like that what goes through your mind when you hear things like that well, I feel like crying right now. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, it breaks my heart because if you know someone and you hear their story, if you could put yourself in that situation, you would you would never make that decision to say you can't come. Mm -hmm. You would open your arms and welcome them in. And you know, we know from hearing the story of the women that we work with that. Many of them have, it is not an easy decision to decide to leave your home country. It's not a fly by night, oh, I'm going to go to America and get rich. It's, it, I can't even imagine the things that someone has to think about to consider before they put themselves and their children at risk to leave the situation they're in. But it, it means it's a very dire situation. <sighs> and so. once they come here, um, they're working so hard. These are the most hardworking people you've you've ever met. They are so so full of just courage and resilience, and they work so hard, and they are so generous. I have learned so much about generosity from interacting with people who have next to nothing, and yet they will give me all kinds of things, and I don't even need it, um, but they would offer it all to me, so. Um, That's great to hear. Now, I know Foray has a 10th anniversary fundraiser. It's coming up next Tuesday. Tell us yes. a little bit about those details. Yeah, so that's very exciting. We will be at the Schlafly Tap Room on Locust from 5.30 to 8, and celebrating our 10 years. We have a wonderful video made by um, John Hambach Hambacher with Pinnacle Video, celebrating, really featuring Loon, and celebrating what, what got has done the last 10 years um, and it'll be an opportunity for people from the community to join in and help us for continue our mission uh, and if people want more um, information about that can you give us your website yes it's foray f-o-r-a-i dot org and you can go right there and the drop down menus will tell you you know where to get tickets or where to look at the different products that we make Jennifer Owens of 4A, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. And Luz Mila Buchler and Ning Lun, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.